been receiving some really disturbing reports. It's taking them all. Already, 70% of the Jaguars have vanished. They used to live here. Now there's just devastation. It's destroying everything. Reports suggest African penguins are starving as the machine takes over our seas, hoovering up masses of fish. There's little left for them to eat. Not long ago, penguins were all over this beach. Now they're gone. All gone. People here say the machine is hungry for land. It destroys everything in its path. Elephants used to wander all over these forests. Then, just like that, they vanish. We're also hearing how the machine churns out pollutants and waste as it produces feed for farm animals confined in cages and factory farms here in Europe. Scientists now say we're looking at a mass extinction. The machine is taking our wildlife. Hi everyone, Robbie here from Plant Based News. I'm here with Leah Garces from Compassion in World Farming. Um, and we're going to talk a bit about campaigning within the organization and also factory farming. So Leah, welcome. Thank you, thanks Robbie. So tell us a bit about your role in Compassion, um, in f Compassion in World Farming and, and how you fit into the picture. I have the great privilege of being the U.S. Executive Director of Compassion in World Farming. So I run our office um, and really we have been very much focused on engaging food businesses and helping them to change their policies uh, so that farm animals can have a better life. And you obviously um, work and function as a campaigning organization too. I was a big fan of your Stop the Machine um, viral video that I don't know if you guys have seen it, check it out, Stop the Machine on YouTube. It, was, it did really, really well. It was really engaging and quite po powerful. Can you talk a bit about how that happened? Yeah, I mean, Stop the Machine is, thank you for the plug, it is, I think, one of our best uh, video campaign products. Um, and it's really talking about the sustainability of the planet and how our diets relate to that, how our diet choices are directly and indirectly related to the destruction of the planet, in particular wildlife. And so it tries to really connect people to that concept that what you eat directly impacts the planet and particularly iconic wildlife like elephants and um, Sumatran, el uh, Sumatran elephants and jaguars and things that we wouldn't directly relate to. You know, you have your chicken sandwich and you don't think that has anything to do with elephants, but it does. It does. It directly does. So factory farming is, is a leading cause of like, global greenhouse emissions, uh, ocean dead zones, deforestation, species extinction. I'll talk a bit about like why we're against factory farming as a kind of you know industri industrial modality. Yeah, I think that a lot of the we're here at a, a conference on extinction. It's called extinction, purposefully so, because we see that our, our food choices are are one of the big drivers for greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, and in fact, the UN has concluded that we will not reach the UN goal, which is to not go over two degrees, to, uh, and, and that's been agreed widely by governments. We will not, diets alone will take us over that limit. And we have to address our diets if we want to, to even get close to our goals in terms of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions or even maintaining them at their current, current levels. So let's talk a bit about the history of factory farming and how we found ourselves in this situation. Um, you know, could you just speak a bit about how the current industrial machine really got to the state and the place that it is now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because where I live, which is Atlanta, Georgia, uh, really is the birthplace of factory farming. And it started in North Georgia, a man named Jesse Jewell. He had a, a feed industry, and he was trying to figure out, how can I sell more feed? And he had this idea. He said, I'll, I'll contract out chicken farmers, and then they'll have to buy my feed, and that will be a way to make more money for my feed. It really started with this concept of feed. And he did that, and he was very successful, so much so that he was able to buy a processing plant. And here we, ha and then as a result, we had the first vertically integrated system where one company, one man owned the feed, he owned the chickens, so he would lend the chickens to these farmers and then buy them back at the end, and the processing plant. And that is the model we essentially use today. Uh, and what it did was really commoditize animals. It took the animals off of the land from being backyard birds, occasionally eaten on a Sunday, to widgets in a factory 
really desensitizing us, taking animals out of sight, out of mind, uh, so that when they ended up on our plates, we didn't really have a thought for where they came from or who they were. Obviously, there's two schools of thought in the world today. There's kind of welfareism and abolitionism. You know, the abolitionists believe that we should stop eating and consuming animals for a multitude of reasons, whether it's ethics, whether it's the environment, whether it's human health, that we should move more towards a total plant-based world where you know animals are not bred in the billions that they are by human beings. And then there's obviously the welfare side, which says you know, we, sh- we can continue, we must consume less, we must treat the animals better um, and if we are going to kill them we need to be more mindful of the practices on um, the land the animals but also to do with consumption and human health um, there's obviously very two very polar worlds there this this event brings a lot of those people together doesn't it those two worlds and how do we create meaningful dialogue between such opposing such em- often quite emotional kind of sides of the picture yeah, I, I always try to focus on progress and reducing suffering. And um, any, I think we can find common ground for everybody in, in, those, in those areas. So um, I think both improving the lives of animals that are eaten is critical. If you, know, you were to ask those animals, you know, which would you like? I think the ones that are in the system today are going to say, please improve the conditions I'm in and work on major reduction. So um, we need by 2050 for the planet to eat 50% less animals than today's levels. And that's a huge thing to lift. Uh, And we all need to focus on that. And we need every partner we can get from environmentalists to health to population concerns from every aspect. We all have to work together to achieve that. And, And so we have to really create a very a tent that everybody can be under in order to achieve that. With things like money being a massive driver in, in this human world, in this capitalist world, how, how could we ever get there? Because there is so much money involved in animal agriculture. It's such a powerful and uh, financial incentive. How can we, how do you work with organizations? How do you, how do you circumvent that? I mean, I'm going to say the G word, greed. Like, how do we get past that? Yeah, well, you know what? I think we work with it rather than against it. Um, and we are seeing this happening. Uh, in th- The truth is, right now, 113 million Americans are regularly choosing plant-based proteins. That's one-third of Americans. If you are a business tycoon, you're thinking, why aren't I? Why don't I have a piece of that market? And you know that was a, a five billion dollar industry last year, and it's growing eight percent year on year at the moment. Uh, and this is of interest to businesses like Tyson. Tyson invested five percent in Beyond Meat. This is the company that you could say they would look at and see as the enemy, but they're not saying it's the enemy. They're saying this is the company that I want a piece of. Because they don't care what what they sell, that whether it's corn, meat, chicken, whatever. They just want to sell. Exactly, and and what we're starting to see is companies reinvent themselves, and and I think in the future companies will not be meat companies; they will be protein companies. And there will be the diversification of protein because it, it's a risky business. If you're a business, it's a risky investment to invest in animal protein. You're never going to have an undercover investigation into your tofu factory. <laughs> that, that leads us nicely onto solutions. So, um, as an organization, how do you, what do you do to kind of help develop solutions? How does that, what does that picture look like? Um, So we think that we are working actively on helping companies in particular and governments uh, find those solutions and uh, advise them on being transparent and working towards the solutions and being accountable towards those. So those do include, as I said, improving the lives of animals that are in the system today. But it also includes looking towards the future and developing alternative proteins, having a future protein department we're recommending now for companies. If you want to be future-proof, we're saying look at these alternative proteins. You will reduce your risk. You'll, if you hedge your bets, this is, this is a growing market. It's only going to grow. Absolutely. I think we had one of your speakers, Derek, um, from Tesco, the new... Um, innovator for plant-based food. Director of 
work at Base Innovations at Tesco. New position, yep, newly recruited. Yeah, Tesco, for all the, um, our US read, uh, viewers, Tesco is one of the largest, pretty much the largest um, UK supermarket chain. So get, seeing them get involved with the plant-based revolution is quite exciting. They've got a massive range of vegan plant-based cheeses which came out which I think have doubled in consumption year on year so yeah it's quite exciting um, so when it comes to kind of changing the world obviously as an individual a lot of people feel quite powerless they feel like I'm just one person what can I really do is there any point in me cutting back on meat I like eating meat I like you know uh, hunting animals for sport I want to just keep my life you know the way it is how do we shift the world when there are many people who, who enjoy consuming animals three times um, a day, seven days a week? How do we, how do we position the message to them uh, in a way that is kind of non-judgmental or non-kind of preachy? Yeah, I think the good thing about it is there's a place to garner everybody's concerns within this issue. So maybe you just care about yourself and your health. Well, good news. Eating more plants, eating less meat is very, very helpful for you to lose weight, have a healthier diet, to live longer, to look more beautiful. All of these things can be you know, helpful, have better skin is what I mean. And, uh, so uh, if that's what you care about, but maybe you just care about your wallet. You can also save money by going, eating, less, uh, eating less meat and eating more whole foods, uh, legumes, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. There's a place. There's a place for everybody's concerns uh, if if they want them. But let's say you're a person who, regardless, is just going to always go in the meat aisle and eat uh, eat meat, and that's you just don't. You're just never going to care. I think in future, clean meat or lab-based meat is going to be catering to those people. I think uh, the reality is, meat consumption. Um, does continue and it continues to go up as population goes up in terms of the number of animals and we have to be serious about that um if we it's just not enough land is there really yeah i i like to say this is just a math problem there is literally not enough arable land there is not enough uh clean water in order to sustain 10 billion people which is what we're projecting on current per capita meat consumption it's you can just project out the math it, there's not enough. So if we want to continue to eat like this, there has to be a technological solution. And clean meat, lab meat, is, is going to be that solution. And we know companies are moving fast. We're hearing that in the next year, two, three years, this is going to be available. And I think like the flat screen TV, like the Tesla, like these other technologies, it will just be a matter of time before the price comes down volume, as the volume comes up. It, it will transform how we eat. Can we just talk a bit more again about um, the organization and the kind of framework you have to operate within? Obviously, your, your organization's name is Compassion in World Farming. Now, Compassion is obviously a very interesting word, um, and a lot of our audience are actually vegan, probably, or vegan curious at least, animal lovers. Um, to create change, obviously, you could say you have to get in bed with the enemy or kind of the, not necessarily the enemy, but the opposition is probably a better word. Um, how, how can we help people understand, many of our, our viewers understand that sometimes, you know, going back sometimes helps us go forward? Because there are a lot of our viewers who, who feel that, you know, welfareism is, is a kind of counter, is counterintuitive to the whole respect the earth, respect the animals, because obviously by its nature killing for food in a world that doesn't necessarily need to kill that, those animals is a compassionate act, it's more a selfish act, you know what I mean? So how do we, I know it's a tricky question, but how do we frame that conversation to get more vegans, to get more advocates on our side? Yeah, that... Uh, you must have been asked this before, you must have... Yeah. yeah. Well... You know, I work closely with industry, and um, my strong belief is that we, to truly, to truly change the system, we absolutely have to engage the so-called opposition, and we actually have to um, convert them and not coerce them, and we have to um, not win over them. We have to win them over. And, and these are phrases that I'm borrowing, honestly, from history in terms of other social movements. Um, but because once we have them on our side, then there will be massive change, rapid change, wouldn't there? 
Yes, imagine the meat manufacturers reducing their their um, animal farming in favor of plant-based because that's lucrative and they see the, the point and they care about it. And this is actually happening. You know, Cargill, the largest, one of the largest meat manufacturers in the world just invested in Memphis Meats, which is a lab meat company. And like I said, Tyson has also invested 5% in Beyond Meat. And once we, you know, win them over, for whatever reason, then the system really starts to change because we are not in charge of the animals. We're actually not. We're not the ones putting them there. They are. So if we can work with them and really find out what their problems are too, what are their challenges economically, you know, ethically, what are the issues, and try to help them solve them rather than being oppositional and just really causing them angst and problems, then I think we'd be really get to the root of changing things. Helping big organizations change rather than demanding they change from a, an emotional perspective. Help them see the economic um, and environmental incentives to change, perhaps. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, just coming to the end now, as we're obviously, a lot of what we do is about, um, is about health, it's about environments, but it's also about activism. Um, in many ways, you work, uh, you campaign and kind of you, you're involved in helping people see things in a different way. As individuals, what can people do to be involved in your kind of organization? I mean, I think that, you know, of course, please sign up to our websites. Um, we have many in different countries, depending on where you're watching from. Um, in the U.S., uh, we have ways for you to become active, to either communicate with companies and asking them to do better, um, and you know, generally be a happy, healthy person and be friendly and be educated and uh, help people understand the world we're trying to create.